Well, let's talk about geoetics. Um, the goal of my presentation is to give you a big picture about foundations of geoetics uh, and on two important topics geoetics deals with. I want to start uh, from an initial consideration that you can read uh, in, uh, in this uh, first slide. Geoetically, uh, geoetics initially developed in the context of geosciences as a rediscovery by geoscientists as well as a, a real process of consciousness raising of the social role that they can and should play in support of society in facing global anthropogenic changes. This is a very important uh, starting point. This process, so rediscovery and consciousness raising, uh, led to create two fundamental documents uh, uh, on geoetics. The first one is the Geoetical Promise, uh, a Hippocratic-like quote for geoscientists originally proposed in 2014. And uh, this oath was introduced as official declaration in the geological uh, departments of the Italian University in 2018 during the degree ceremony thanks to the cooperation between IPG Italy and the Italian Geological Society. The Geoetical Promise uh, lists uh, eight commitments of geoscientists toward uh, colleagues, society and environments while practicing their profession. And uh, in this slide you can read the formula and uh, this is a note committing each geoscientist uh, to be honest and to practice the profession for the public good and the protection of the environment. The geoetical promise is part of another fundamental document, the Cape Town Statement on Geoetics, officially released by the IPG in 2016 uh, after the great success of the five sessions uh, that IPG organized at the 35th International Geological Congress in South Africa. And this statement includes also a first list of geoetical values on which to shape behaviors. Um, the Cape Town Statement is supported by 27 geoscience organizations. These are among the most important organizations in the world, like uh, IUGS, the AGU, uh, and, uh, and others. Moreover, the statement was translated in 35 languages, uh, and so I invite you to visit the IPG website to download it. The great development of geoetics in the last uh, uh, 10 years is, do uh, is demonstrated by numerous important books uh, and uh, others books are in preparation by a huge number of events, initiatives, uh, uh, sessions organized by the International Association for Promoting Geoetics uh, in cooperation with other geoscience organizations. And in these slides, you can see the cover of the book, the covers of the book published by our members and uh, uh, con consider that even dozens of papers and chapters have been published in, uh, in other journals, magazines uh, and books. The geoetical, uh, um, sorry, the intraprofessional dimension of geoetics is the bedrock on which we have developed geoetics. So over the years, uh, the theoretical framework of geoetics progressively developed, uh, articulated, and, uh, and reached uh, to the point that from a primarily uh, professional ethics, so basically uh, a deontology, it has expanded to include extra professional responsibilities towards society and the environment until it becomes definable as an ethics of the human agent towards the earth system. So initially, we have studied and created something related to ethical issues in the profession and uh, the relationships between geoscience and society. Then we have started a reflection on the meaning that the geoethical thinking has for humans in, in general. In fact, humans build their niche, their sphere in the earth system, uh, shaping landscapes, modifying earth processes, creating their physical and metaphysical networks and artifacts. They do this from at least 12,000 years. And uh, this process is driven by needs, expectations, idols, uh, fears, principles, values, and feedback processes make changes uh, uh, continuous. Uh, we shape the earth and the earth shape us. Uh, the ways in which we shape the earth is a field of interest of geoetics. We make choice, we take decisions, and this is the focus 
of uh, ethics. And since we are talking about uh, shaping the Earth system, this is the focus of geoethics. Geoethics considers uh, the relationship between human beings and the Earth system as a specific object of an analysis capable of defining the best ways of implementing this relationship in the light of shared values that overcome the differences of the various social, ecological, and cultural context. We need a common language between people. In this sense, geoethics should be considered an ethics for society, a global ethics for a globalized, strictly interconnected world, a global ethics of responsibility towards the Earth system. In order for human interaction with the Earth system to take place in a responsible and forward-looking way, we have to take into account two fundamental concepts. The planetary boundaries, so a set of nine planetary processes within which humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. Uh, crossing these boundaries uh, increases the risk of generating large-scale abrupt uh, or irreversible environmental changes. And the other concept is the social ecological system that is complex adaptative systems in which human communities are embedded in nature. In order for human interaction with the Earth system to take place in a responsible and forward-looking way, as I said before, it is necessary to reconfigure the re this relationship on the basis of new perspectives and through the adoption of practices that are guided by renewed ethical criteria, new ethical principles and values. Faced with the technological development of the 20th century, the German philosopher Hans Jonas had already placed at the center of his ethical proposal the principle of responsibility to guide humans in their technological development. Even in geoethics, we consider the principle of responsibility as the ethical criterion for action to ensure recognition and protection of the intrinsic value of any living and non-living element with which the human being relates on the planet. And the principle of responsibility express, expresses the commitment to answer for our action and their consequences. Making responsible choices requires applying ethical principles in the search for a superior good, not only for the benefit of today's societies, but also considering the impact of human, humanity's choices on future generations like the philosopher Jonas highlighted. In these perspectives, geosciences are a useful set of disciplines for navigating the complexity of modern times. So, but how can geosciences serve society in addressing uh, global anthropogenic changes such as climate change, uh, hazards and risks, natural resources exploitation? Geosciences, geoscience expertise is essential for the functioning of modern and future societies. Geosciences uh, are useful to provide uh, uh, energy and materials to sustain and develop our civilization. Geoscientists uh, have a crucial role for achieving the sustainable development goals. But we should not forget that even geosciences have contributed to habitat degradation, loss of biodiversity, soil impoverishment, ocean acidification, anthropogenic global warming, alteration of biogeochemical cycles. And in several cases, geoscientists have been also a means for those lobbies and powers that have strongly contributed to the ecological crisis. After this consideration, we can ask today, which is the societal role geoscientists play within society? How much ethics is important in modern uh, geosciences? These are only some of the fundamental questions that modern geoscientists uh, aware of the ethical and societal implications of their profession should ask themselves. As any scientist, geoscientists have responsibilities in developing excellent science and international cooperation, as well as in communicating scientific knowledge to different stakeholders. Specifically, geoscientists have great responsibility in creating methods and technologies for assuring people's safety and the responsible use of planet Earth as entity and of its geo-resources. 
to guarantee public welfare and sustainable life conditions for present and future generations. Geoscientists can become promoters of a collective awareness that is able to foster the development of a global governance, which in turn is capable of facing environmental and health issues affecting the whole of humanity, regardless of political, social, economic, uh, uh, and cultural differences. And this is a great responsibility for us. But pay attention to an important aspect. So what I'm saying does not mean considering geoscientists custodians of the truth, of the correct vision for a better future. Rather, it means recalling them to the social duty of connecting scientific knowledge to the sense of value of society, to what is right, to what is wrong, to what is important, and had to dialogue more with people, promoting and sharing values that lead us to look towards a common future. We must consider that the complexity of the world and problems affecting the planet requires interdisciplinary approaches and both transdisciplinary cooperation capable of synthesizing a range of knowledge, methods and tools. And this is one of the goals of promoting a geoethical attitude. Geoethics aims to foster an analytical, critical and scientifically based attitude towards issues concerning uh, uh, the relationship between human beings and the Earth system, defining cultural categories, uh, uh, that is, those concepts we use to put in order inputs we received from the reality and to give meaning to the world, and uh, to defining behavioral values based on experience and scientific knowledge, which contribute to guiding human beings towards more responsible individual and social choices. Transferring this attitude to society intending in all its components, from political decision makers to legislators, to technicians, to the mass media, to citizens, means contributing to the promotion of responsible economic, technological and social development based on political decisions that take into account their consequences on citizens, future generations and the environment. After depicting this picture, now I think it is important to give uh, to give you the definition of geoethics that it is already mentioned by Sasha. This definition sums up some of thoughts I have presented in my previous slides. So geoethics has been defined as research and reflection on the values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices wherever human activities interact with the Earth system. Geoethics deals with the ethical, social, and cultural implications of geoscience knowledge, education, research, practice, and communication, and with the social role and responsibilities of geoscientists. These definitions out this definition outlines the perimeter of the geoethical analysis and actions, underline the need to preliminary identify the values on which to base the choices that define the relationship between the human being and the earth system, placing geosciences at the center of the issues as indispensable disciplines to understand the importance that this relationship is shaped responsibly and sustainably. A wider and articulated definition of geoethics is provided by me and my colleague Silvia Pepoloni in 2000. Uh, 19, while a scheme of the theoretical structure of geoethics is shown and this uh, and the following slide from a paper Sylvia and I have published in the last book uh, on geoethics published by the Geological Society of London. This scheme contains the definition of geoethics, its fundamental characteristics, it provides its social per perspective, it gives indications about the cultural ground of geoethics. The scheme highlights uh, the three main principles of geoethics, responsibility, dignity, and freedom. It's four domains of interaction, the self, the interpersonal domain, the societal domain, the environmental domain, and the scheme contains also the geoethical values of for each of these domains and consequent actions to be uh, developed by embracing those values, leading human beings to reach the awareness of being a moral subject, so beings capable to consider ethical issues and to make ethical choices, to realize justice towards current and future generations 
as goals of direction as well as to respect the geodiversity and biodiversity and social ecological systems. These schemes may become a proposal on which to base a new pedagogy for our societies based on geoscience knowledge. This is the scheme for developing geoethics as a project for putting in practice the geoethical thinking. We have two fundamental principles that are at the base of geoethics. I repeat them, dignity, freedom, and responsibility. Dignity is the recognition of the existential rights and values to anyone, including oneself, or to anything. Dignity uh, presupposes the intention to respect oneself and others. Geoethical action is functional to recognize the right to existence for any entity and its value. Freedom is the existential condition of the human agent, thanks to which the individual is able to think, to process, to choose through options without external constraints that limit their intellectual and operational faculties. I have already talked about the responsibility in, uh, uh, previous, uh, in a previous slides. These principles are applied to the four relational domains of human life, and several values are defined for each domain, bringing to act in order to aim at other three aspirational principles, awareness, justice, and respect. These are the goals of the geoethical actions, becoming more aware, becoming more just, becoming more respectful. But it is evident that if we don't preliminarily recognize and share into the human communities the three fundamental principles, it is impossible to create the conditions for the application of aspirational principles. In this table, you can see the scheme of the geoethical values referred to the four relational domains of human life. The principle of responsibility guides the research of the values useful to reach the aspirational principles. If we refer to the self domain, the responsibility is rooted uh, into the individual ethics of each person, as well as when we refer to the interpersonal domain. The responsibility shapes the social and professional relationships. And in this, in this second case, it brings to develop code of ethics to assure professional ethics and research integrity. Both in the case of the self and the interpersonal domains, values that drive behaviors are the same. Honesty, integrity, accuracy, reliability, transparency, listening, and sharing. When we deal with the societal domain, responsibility is applied towards social stakeholders and the values that drive behaviors are equity, inclusivity, cooperation, adaptation, prevention, sustainability, geo-education, inter- and multidisciplinarity. Finally, if we deal with the environmental domain, the principle of responsibility becomes ecological. The responsibility is towards the earth system, stewardship, sustainability, impact minimization, protection, conservation, enhancement become the reference values to be respectful towards the earth system. Now it is probably more clear that development of geoethics is a, at the turning point. The intra-professional perspective of geoethics is narrow. Geoethical thinking has a big potential for being proposed to society, but this raises new considerations. After having strengthened the theoretical structure of geoethics and launched new initiatives aimed at favoring the spread of geoethical thinking, geoethics must deal with some issues concerning the social organization of dominant cultures, the existing economic structures, and the political systems that govern the world. So the development of geoethics is going beyond intraprofessional boundaries by pushing to create new bridges between geoscientists and philosophers, social and political scientists, economists. And this give additional geosocietal perspective to uh, geosci uh, geosciences. This can help geoethics to be proposed really as a global ethics. For any kind of information about geoethics and the International Association for Promoting Geoethics, I invite you to visit our website, the IPG 
is a leading organization founded in 2012 in Brisbane, Australia during the 34th International Geological Congress. From an idea conceived in April 2012 during the first session, Silvia Pepoloni organized the European Geosciences Union General Assembly in Vienna. Up to date, the IPG has become a global network of 2,800 members in 128 countries on five continents with 34 national sections, one board of experts, one early career scientist team, and the four task groups to draft white papers on responsible mining that is already available, on forensic geology, on geoheritage, on responsible uh, speleology. And moreover, the IPG has seven affiliations, uh, 25 agreements for cooperation and four partnership. You are all invited to become IPG members. There is no fee to pay. It's completely free of charge and you will receive our newsletter and uh, will be informed about our all um, initiatives. Now, I like to give you some details about uh, the white paper on responsible mining. This is another very important document released by the IPG in 2017. This document testifies our commitment to contribute to improving the relationship between uh, uh, geoscientists involved in delicate activities and society. Um, modern society is totally dependent on both energy and on non-energy minerals. The latter are essential for manufacturing and supply of uh, renewable green energy. They also provide the materials to build homes, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, the infrastructures needed by human communities. And despite some financial downturns across the globe over the past 12 years, the demand for raw materials such as known energy minerals keeps increasing due to the improving average condition of the world economy and the population grow growth. A continuous supply of minerals will be uh, necessary also in the future to boost both developed and developing economies. Minerals are at the base also of the digital revolution in which we are living and mining is vital for our civilization is, as uh, it was for past civilizations. So looking at the positive sides, mining generating wealth has the potential to improve the economy, infrastructure and quality of life and brings opportunities for economic growth and diversification. Mining generates revenue for governments through royalties and tax income. It also brings skilled employment, technology transfer and training for people together with the, um, further jobs uh, through the multiplier effect. Mining can bring substantial improvements in physical, social, legal, and financial infrastructure. What is the other side of the coin? If not properly managed, economic growth and development can come at a cost to the environment and to the social equilibrium of local communities with the possibility of irreversible negative consequences, land degradation, groundwater pollution, chemical contamination, ecosystem destruction, social instability, corruption. And while mining has historically affected its surrounding environment, advances in technology and changes in public attitudes and management uh, techniques are now making many negative impacts avoidable. Increasingly, Mining companies are making efforts also to reduce the social and environmental impact of mining and to minimize the footprint of their activities uh, throughout the mining cycle, uh, including restoration of land and uh, ecosystems after mining. Initiatives like, for example, mining with principles of the International Council of Mining and Metals are tangible efforts to create a new paradigm for activities that are unfortunately globally perceived uh, even legit, uh, as a legitimate per, uh, perception, more for their negative consequences on the health of people and biosystems rather than for also the opportunities to create wealth and development for societies. From this perspective, the IPG wanted to contribute to the international efforts to change the operative paradigm in mining by considering two fundamental concepts, sustainable development uh, and geoethics in order to contribute to changing this, the business mining paradigm in a responsible mining paradigm. The definitions of sustainable development and geoethics contain numerous suggestions for creating a new cultural paradigm that might assure 
more responsible uh, human action towards humanity and the dynamics of nature. In this context, geosciences play a fundamental role in defining the limits of sustainability of the planet and uh, in leading to the appropriate behaviors, uh, practices, activities to respect the li these limits to assure sustainability of human life on the planet while respecting social ecological systems. The white, the white paper deals with values, uh, concepts and best practices to be considering in mining activity for future uh, generations from the perspective of sustainable development. This document summarizes the results also of an extensive survey of relevant literature. It is an orienting document aimed uh, to provide uh, essential elements to, of reference to frame these important issues in a geoethical perspective in order to push different stakeholders to take into consideration prudent extraction and use of georesources, the respect of the natural environment by minimizing the impact of mining activities, the need to increase the awareness and respect of local population, the adoption of high standards of quality and improved health and safety conditions in the working environment, as well as the development also of innovative technologies and the implementation of eco-friendly and social-friendly best practices. Uh, the white paper highlights uh, that responsible mining demonstrably respects and protects the interest of all stakeholders, human health and the environment, and contributes uh, discernibly and uh, fairly to broad economic development for, of the producing country and to benefit local communities while embracing best international practice, practices and upholding the rule of law. The white paper lists uh, the following practices and guidelines for developing and implementing responsible mining. So identify and engage all relevant uh, actors, the stakeholders, conduct open, inclusive and continuing dialogue with local communities, um, engage with communities and stakeholders at, and identify areas in which there is reasonable alignment of values protect the environment and minimize our, or mitigate any environmental impacts on people and communities, including on the use of resources such as energy, water, and productive soils. Cooperate closely with regional and local stakeholders, better to understand biodiversity and conservation issues, and so on. Acknowledge the possibility that when a project does not meet basic environmental and social criteria for acceptance, Building and operating and operating a mining is not the right outcome. And this is a very important point. Promote energy savings and increase the use of renewable energy sources such as solar panels and wind to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Manage waste in an efficient and safe way by improving its transportation and tailings management, preventing any environmental contamination and reusing waste where possible. Plan, plan closure and rehabilitation based on environmentally and socially sustainable standard elements and management systems, conduct tailor-made and fit to propose research to develop technology innovations and advanced methodologies to reduce potential negative environmental impacts. And the last three points, the guarantee access to conflict-free minerals by exploring for potential sources of these minerals outside active conflict zones or replacing conflict minerals provide a safe and healthy work environment for all employees and contribute to the health and safety of surrounding communities. Educate students on the importance of effectively managing mineral resources, as well as protecting the environment and assuming social responsibility. Responsible mining is possible, is still possible. Based on these three uh, 13 points, it is clear that the responsible mining aims to build uh, uh, a system capable of ensuring and promoting responsible ex extraction of minerals and developing a proper alignment of the corresponding benefits at uh, local, regional, national and global scales. So the white paper clearly affirms that responsible mining does not only require actions and commitments from mining companies. That is, uh, 
crucial, but is likewise dependent on the active and constructive engagement and involvement of all actors, including governments. Obviously, the white paper is not, uh, does not pretend to be exhaustive, uh, but it mentions uh, some additional aspect that a public discussion needs carefully to address, the contribution of mining to the sustainable development goal of the United Nations, the deep sea mining, a very delicate matter because of, of its differences in terms of types of social and environmental issues from those related to mining activities on land and the difficulty to predict its long term impact on ecosystem. This is uh, another odd topics uh, for uh, uh, for geosciences for the near future. Artisanal and small scale mining that provide a livelihood to millions of mostly poor people worldwide and that often cause severe environmental damages and huge risks to human health. These are crucial issues for geoethics and we already started a reflection on them in our task group. Now I want to give you a geoethical perspective about another important topic, georisks. The graph shows the global number of people affected by natural disaster in the range uh, 19, uh, 2019. Um, so before the current pandemic, the global number is the sum of the injured, affected and uh, left uh, homeless after a, a disaster. Affected are those people requiring immediate assistance during a period of emergency. And I read the comment by authors of this chart. The data presented here includes all categories classified as natural disasters distinguished from technological disasters. And this includes those from drought, floods, uh, extreme weather, extreme temperature, land, landslides, wildfires, volcanic activity, and earthquakes. And the authors of the chart highlight uh, that natural disasters kill on average uh, six, uh, 60,000 people per year globally. Deaths from natural disasters have seen a large decline over the past century from in some years in uh, sorry from in some years uh, uh, millions of deaths per year to an average of uh, 60,000 over the past decade and historically droughts and floods were the most fatal disaster events deaths from these events are uh, now uh, lower the most deadly events today tend to be earthquakes and disaster uh, uh, disasters affect those in poverty most heavily I that tolls tend to be centered in low to middle income countries without the infrastructure to protect and respond uh, to events. I can add two considerations. Natural disasters depends on human behaviors. This is a good, a good news for us because we can do a lot to reduce disasters. And natural disasters are social events affecting especially poor people. So disasters are linked to a general problem of social inequalities. Facing natural hazards and managing related risks is an, active involving, uh, an activity involving many actors in the disaster cycle. Activities are related to scientific studies, technological applications, monitoring, education to population, psychological support, social intervention, financial and legal tools. Facing risks means to build a community of purpose for improving societal resilience. We have to consider that natural phenomena have always scared populations. The fear is not eliminable. Uh, but nowadays, the, the scientific progress can assure a good level of safety. Obviously, the damage to geohazards is not entirely avoidable, but can be greatly reduced for prevention and mitigation effects, efforts. Um, through, a, uh, for example, an effective information and education of society. Geoscientists are social actors with the responsibility to serve society at the best of their capabilities, since they possess the scientific knowledge and preparation to bring geoscience closer to society and to help human communities in the defense against geo risks. Which is the relationship between geoethics and geohazards and geo risks? To these regards, let me mention the Italian architect Piero Ligorio in the 16th century during the Renaissance. Ligorio affirmed the concept that 
after the, um, an earthquake in Ferrara, in the northern Italy, I filmed the concept that to understand the causes of earthquakes and to find a way to defend the population from damages are prerogatives that are in the possibilities of human rationality. Moreover, trying to reach the safety of our houses is not only a necessity, but also an ethical duty of the human intellect. Four centuries ago, so, Ligorio introduced the concept that as, as rational beings, we do have an ethical duty, that is to defend our human beings from geological hazards. Since I can add, we are able to study them and in many cases also to predict their effects. But what do we mean by risks? We all know that the risk is defined as the symbolic product of hazard vulnerability and exposure. It is quantified such as the loss produced on an element or group of elements at risk as a consequence of the occurrence of a given phenomenon of a given intensity. All these factors have been introduced to analyze the impact of natural phenomena on humankind and their effects. Um, and and the, their effects are quantified using mathematical tools, including the probability calculus and uh, uh, the evaluation of errors and uh, uncertainties. The uncertainty of science is a fundamental concept, may be not sufficiently emphasized. Nowadays, scientists are able to predict with some degree of uncertainty the onset and development over time of some natural um, phenomena. Moreover, the progress of science is giving us new tools to defend ourselves Against, against risks, new methods for detecting and the continuous monitoring of phenomena, the use of early warning methods and tools, efficient building techniques to ensure safety, uh, adequate prevention programs, careful land management, effective education and communications to citizens. All these activities are what we call prevention. But at the same time, science doesn't provide absolute certainty. And in fact, in geohazard and georisk studies, uncertainty, error, and probability are essential elements because they affect the way in which we can manage the risk. As the Italian astrophysicist Margherita Ack said, on the Earth, not everything is predictable, but science can be used even when it foresees the absolute unpredictability. As you know well, geoscientists are not able to establish at the same time when and where an earthquake will occur and how strong it will be. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean we cannot find solutions to reduce the risk, to develop appropriate policies in risk management, even in the absence of full scientific certainty. So the question is, how can we manage uncertainty? Science cannot give absolute certainty due to its intrinsic and epistemic limits and we run the risk seriously to block any possibility of progress of humankind um, if we manage the uncertainty only by adopting the precautionary principle in science on this point a wise solution has been offered by giuseppe grandori an italian earthquake engineering engineer who defined the acceptable limit of risk through this short statement. Defending oneself from earthquakes means reducing the consequences of earthquakes, casualties and property damage below a limit that society considers acceptable, taking into account the costs that a further reduction of the limit would imply. This is a, a scientific and a pragmatic approach, even if it, at the first instance it could be appear uh, um, a scenic uh, approach, but it's uh, uh, really important. When there is a, a real or potential risk, we have to use also the common sense to assess the cost, but also the benefits of a risk mitigation strategy, a strategy which today may seem a waste could be effective in a larger um, uh, in a larger perspective, looking at its uh, likely outcome oh sorry yeah uh, in this regard it is uh, emblematic the case of fudai that is known as the japanese village that in 2011 uh, during the tohoku earthquake defeated the tsunami in the uh, the uh, the tsunami that uh, occurred after the earthquake in the 70s the wise major of the city kotaku wamura did provide us a wall 60 meters high 
that was supposed to protect citizens for possible tsunamis. For years, the building was the center of controversies, considered as a, a useless waste of money, a mindless and disproportionate work. But in 2011, that wall saved the, the lives of 3,000 people. The run-up of the tsunami in Fudai was uh, 20 meters. While all around Fudai, other cities were raised to the ground and had to face social and economic costs unimaginable at the time of those controversies. Through this story, I would like to emphasize that prevention is a value, a value for geoetics. But unfortunately, our society doesn't perceive it as such. And what is worse, politicians tend not to support and promote something that gives its fruits in the long term as prevention activities. So it is our duty as geoscientists to transfer this value to society, for example, by giving emphasis to cases of good land management and consequent reduction of disasters in a certain area. There are a lot of good examples. Prevention must be intended not only in terms of cost savings, but mainly as a social and cultural attitudes that gives its fruit in a short and long-term perspectives. Prevention is our rational and responsible answer to the right of safety of each citizens to reduce also the social vulnerability and to improve the societal resilience, namely the ability to respond to a disaster by restoring the material and also the spiritual conditions existing before the event. It is evident that non-investing in prevention means to transfer irresponsibly the social and economic costs of a disaster on the shoulders of future generations. So prevention is above all an ethical duty of our society. The defense against georisks involves many actors, not only geoscientists, but also decision makers, local authorities, government agencies, mass media citizens, and all these actors forms a defense systems. Um, only the good relationships among them can guarantee a coordinated effort and consequently the efficiency during all the phases related to the disaster cycle. A proper risk management requires that each role is well defined and governed by shared operational protocols especially during the emergency phase, so that overlapping and misunderstanding don't jeopardize population safety and economic activities. Risk reduction requires an all of society engagement and partnership, as clearly indicated also in the guiding principles of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. In general, people are scarcely prepared in science, and this implies an, an inadequate risk perception and consequently a low resilience of the human communities. And you, you see also this with the COVID-19 emergency. Moreover, in general, citizens are considered as passive actors in a risk scenario. While they can play a key role, certainly they have to be put in the condition to contribute constructively to their own safety. A more prepared society in scientific terms, well informed about the possible causes and effects of the phenomena, would be able to discern the quality of the media information and force the media to become conscious, uh, conscious, um, uh, conscientious spokespersons of the social instances, would be capable of evaluating choices for of who manage the territory and to demand from them more efficacious actions. A virtuous cycle uh, would be triggered in which all the actors involved uh, um, would assume the ethical responsibility of their role. From the geoscientist perspective, there is the need to define the perimeter of, of direction and therefore to identify the role that the geoscientist must play in the decision making chain. Regarding this aspect, a paradigmatic and negative example is the L'Aquila earthquake case. But we are something similar now in, in another case in New Zealand that maybe some of you know. In the, in the judgment at first instance, six scientists and one top officer of the Italian Civil Protection Department were convicted for negligence in the seismic risk assessment after the city of L'Aquila had been destroyed in 2009 by an earthquake and 300 people died. The lack of clarity on the role of the various actors involved, decision makers, scientists, mass media and population, 
lead to a confused message to citizens about the risk they were running and about the preventive actions to be adopted. But with the third and final judgment, all scientists were acquitted, and this made it clear that negligence cannot be attributed to scientists that in fact provide information about the seismic risk of the area, who only had the role of scientific advisors and not of decision makers. So only the civil protection officer was found guilty for that disaster. This is an important point. The distinction of the roles and responsibility is fundamental in the risk management that has legal implications. Uh, so geoscientists have the duty to make society aware that science cannot be the solution to all, all our problems, but science can propose helpful tools to defend our lives, although it is accompanied by a certain level of uncertainty. In this and the next slides, I have listed 19 actions about geo-risk management from a geoethical perspective. First of all, in the risk decision chains, as I said before, roles and responsibilities of each actor have to be uh, clearly fixed. Point two, the geoscientists need to be more aware of their social role. They are not decision makers, but they must provide reliable, unbiased, and update science-based information to decision and policy makers so that decisions and policies adopted will be scientifically grounded. An acceptable limit of risk can be evaluated on scientific basis, but it remains a political decision. Geoscientists have to act wisely in the light of geoethical values, considering a reasonable balance between cost and benefits of prevention for suggesting realistic risk mitigation policies. Developing synergies between geoscience community, government agencies, and local administrator administrations through the development of operational protocols and the definition of encoded stream of information from the scientific community to the authorities is necessary to assure a fruitful strategy to face geo risks. Informing population on natural risk is a priority and an ethical commitment for geoscientists. Scientific data, results and scenarios have to be explained to population while respecting scientific accuracy and presenting the inappropriate ways to be ways to be understood, as well as people have to be informed about the limits of the scientific methods used. Sorry, I have to go. OK. And more, geoscientists should organize a communication strategy before, during and after emergency phase, because our three uh, stages completely different. Strengthening the use of new communication tools like social networks and being available to hear a reply to doubts and personal beliefs of people on hazards. Geoscience research outcomes must be public with explanatory information that are shaped on the basis of different final users, clearly distinguishing scientific observations from working hypotheses. This is a, a pillar of uh, the scientific methods that unfortunately is ma ma um, many times is not respected. Um, society has to be helped to replace a culture based on facing the emergency with a culture centered on prevention to reduce geo risks. Developing educational campaigns on geohazards and geo risks need a societal involvement. Their aim should be not only to simply transfer scientific data, but also to increase awareness and then responsibility. Scientific knowledge is not a one-way road. In citizen science, people are involved in the scientific endeavor, uh, providing precious insights to scientists, uh, and this cooperation generates knowledge, understanding, awareness, and again, responsibility. Now, I want to finish my presentation. I have finished my presentation about uh, the focus on uh, uh, geoethics and uh, uh, two important topics, but I like to also to give uh, to highlight some of the initiatives uh, by the IPG that we are carrying out to develop, to teach and to promote geoethics uh, uh, worldwide. 
In 2019, we found the school on geoethics and natural issues. The school is a place for teaching and learning of the principles and value of, of geoethics. In the dedicated page of the IPG website, uh, you find online resources and videos for a short course on geoethics. In 2019, Silvia Pepoloni, uh, who is the IPG Secretary General, was invited to found the Springer Briefs uh, series in geoethics, a series of short publications on specific geoethical issues. In this series, one book on sociological aspects in mining exploration has been published, and the second book on geoethics in Peru is at the printing stage, and the third book is in preparation. Uh, more information and instructions uh, for the submission can be found uh, at the link uh, in this slide. The first uh, edition of the Geoetics Medal was launched on October 2017, and we had the first medalist in 2018. In the, uh, today, probably, we will announce, uh, announce the 2021 medalist for this year. So we, are an, uh, we have an ex -equo. Finally, in 2017, we officially launched the International Geodetics Day. The International Geodetics Day is held every year during the Earth Science Week, so the day is uh, not fixed, but depends on the Earth Science Week. And again, you get more information by visiting uh, the dedicated page on the IPG website. And to conclude, I wish to thank uh, uh, Silvia, who gave me the permission to use uh, several of our slides and in these final slides there is my mail don't hesitate to contact me for further information thanks for your attention